I'd like to take the time to introduce our next speaker. Uh, he'll be joining us via Zoom. This is uh, Scott Chalmers. He is a dedicated professional with a rich background in agriculture and research. He is in Manitoba. And since 2007, he has been part of the Manitoba Agriculture and as a diversification technician. And now he is an applied research specialist with the uh, Westman Agriculture Diver Diversification Program. So he is significant in his contribution to plot research and demonstrations. And um, so, Scott, I believe everyone can hear you now. And the floor is yours. Fantastic. Thank you for the invite. And uh, this is a way I can almost time travel uh, with Zoom. Um, I know Peace River and Manning are quite far away. And uh, down here in Melita at the Banana Belt, uh, I don't know how long it would take to drive, but uh, I'm very pleased to, uh, to attend your, uh, your meeting today. And uh, today I'll be talking about the ins and the outs of intercropping from at least a Manitoba perspective. And I tried to kind of pick, uh, I don't know, some of our projects that might be more in tune with you guys up there, up in the North. So down in Melita here, I'm in the Southwest corner of Manitoba and we actually have quite a few heat units uh, compared to some of our other uh, locations or sister sites that we have. Uh, so the diversification centers are spread across the province in Roblin, Carberry, and Arburg. And uh, I manage the Melita site here. And uh, we have about uh, a total of 2,500 to 2,600 crop heat units. Um, that's, you know, frost till frost. So uh, we do grow a bit of corn here, uh, but most of the corn is grown in the Red River Valley around Winnipeg. Um, just to mention, uh, Melita is known for its huge banana that they erected in, I think it was 2011 or so, and it only lasted about a year until uh, it got so hot in Melita because the, the recycling building burned down uh, on July long weekend uh, because we had three hobos who had uh, showed up in town and they stayed the night at the recycling building and I think they burned the place down. Anyway, the the banana got scalded on its skin and they had to repurpose the skin by sending the banana back to Calgary to, uh, to get refurbished. But uh, the banana has been unscathed since. And uh, I just thought it was interesting. Uh, they call us the banana belt because usually we have the, the highest degree, uh, you know, in the, the daily high in the province quite often. So everybody's always amazed with us. So in comparison to uh, Manning, I uh, just looked at the map today to see uh, kind of where you guys were. And uh, in comparison, uh, your growing degree days in Manning are, it looks like around 1,000 to 1,200. And in Melita here, we're around 1,400 to 1,600, which is quite a stark difference. This is just a aerial image of one of our sites in 2019. And you can see the array of different projects we have. Uh, because we're a diversification center, uh, we pretty much deal with everything. Uh, we've dealt with uh, even dryland rice before, which never worked. War beans, which didn't work. Uh, but uh, we do have some corn and sunflower, um, faba beans, that sort of thing. Here's the trusty Wado crew we had in in this year uh without them you know i really wouldn't have much to present today and uh you know kudos goes out to them for all their hard work <clears throat> we put on uh, just like uh napera does we put on different field tours during the year uh bring out people to check out the plots and uh you know talk the crop uh we're a strictly no-till organization uh, it's been like that since 2007. We do our best not to use any tillage, but uh, we basically have a seed hawk drill 
and a, uh, a vacuum planter for doing corn and sunflowers. And one of the things I really like to do at uh, Wado, we've been doing this since 2009, is looking at intercrops. And that is growing two or more crops at the same time in the same place. <clears throat> we also have done a little bit of cover crops, but uh, um, you know, this is more on the forage side and uh, we, we try to find ways to integrate uh, some cover crops or relay crops perhaps uh, <clears throat> in, the, in order to try and get some other benefits. Uh, we just don't have even enough time down here in Melita to grow cover crops after annual crops uh, like they do in the United States. Um, we maybe can get to, you know five to six inches of biomass, but then the frost comes and kills everything anyway. And uh, for all that work, I don't think it's worth it unless you have a way of growing the cover crops during the crop season alongside your cash crop. <clears throat> so why would you want to companion crop now? Um, we find there's it's mostly natural solutions why you want to do this. Uh, for example, uh, we find there's nitrogen transfer between legume species. For example, we seem to increase mycorrhizae. Uh, the timing of growth can be either similar or different, and you can maybe take advantage of that by um, extending your shoulder seasons, for example. There's water use efficiencies. Uh, you know, if you've got excess moisture, you can probably count on using a lot more water uh, per acre if you've got some, some uh, companion crop growing. Uh, reduces climate risk, and this is kind of goes with the excess moisture. Uh, less salinity because we're using more moisture. Um, improved soil organic matter. That's just because there's more roots per unit area growing and sequestering more carbon. Uh, we have reduced soil erosion, of course. We, we often see better feed quality, uh, you know, if it's comparing to just, say, grazing corn, having a cover or a companion adds to the, the quality, and I'll show you that a bit later. Uh, pest and stability. Uh, we actually have less pests uh, we've, we've been finding with companions. Uh, I'm not sure why, but I think it's just confusing for the pests if there's more than just one thing growing. Uh, bee health, we, we often see that improve. And uh, there's also the reasons of maybe the pesticides are in common so we can companion crop. Um, there's maybe attractive markets. Uh, there's shatter tolerance in say pea canola uh, within the canola itself. And uh, maybe there's BMP programming happening within your province and you can uh, unlock some of that, uh, that value. And then on the capital side, <clears throat> when land values get a little high, often farmers who are strapped for land, who want to find land, find intercropping to be a way to produce more grain per acre. Um, and that uh, they actually have almost shrunk feel, uh, farm sizes because intercropping had been so successful, they don't actually need to manage so much land anymore. Uh, a couple of farms have found that around this area. <clears throat> uh, Multi-crop seeding equipment, uh, like the pitcher down in the corner with the, the air cart. Um, you know, we got so many uh, compartments on the new seeding equipment now, it actually makes it possible to seed multiple crops and uh, with their uh, variable rate technology as well. And, uh, you know, there's quite a few sophisticated seeding, uh, sorry, seed cleaning equipment uh, operations out there that uh, really intercropping is perfectly suited for people who sell seed um, because they already have the cleaning system. <clears throat> so what is really actually happening with intercrops physiologically? Uh, there's lots of reasons. Uh, I would say... It's, uh, you know, kind of one of those things where it's like a, a thousand cuts sort of thing that really uh, cause, cause the issue. Um, 
that being, for example, leaky, uh, leaky peas. Peas tend to leak uh, some of their nitrogen they fix. And uh, a long time ago, in 1987, Norm Swosky from the U of M found that between 9 to 12% of the uh, nitrogen fixed in pea is leaked into the soil uh, and never used. So uh, why not use that? So, and we also find there's root to root interactions, uh, pH changes in the root zone and nitrogen transfer. So we often see uh, nitrogen transferring from peas to mustard or canola, for example. Uh, it's been also traced from peas to oats. And uh, that is a, actually quite a range. It's anywhere from 8% to 44% of the nitrogen derived from the atmosphere in the pea is transferred to the other crop. And that's quite huge if that's really the case. Uh, that has been found by uh, Melanie Reed, for example, in her thesis from the U of M just a couple of years ago. <clears throat> Schmigalski found that uh, there's also light use efficiencies, water use efficiencies, mycorrhizae, uh, nutrient efficiencies, just, uh, you know, sparing effect. Maybe one crop uses one nutrient more than the other, and the other crop uses one nutrient different than the other crop. So there's synergies there. Oh, we also find there's maturity differences in the pea canola, for example, or canola uh, grows, you know, a couple weeks later than pea and maybe probably uses uh, some extra resources like water and nutrients. And uh, again, uh, pests like uh, aphids, we see fewer aphids in pea, um, pea canola, because uh, maybe it has something to do with the smell of the canola or the look of the canola. Why aphids don't want to do that, uh, is that, I'm not too sure, but it, it happens. <clears throat> and I just wanted to uh, uh, kind of show you the root depth here, where peas are quite shallow. That's they root about 40 centimeters deep, where canola goes all the way to 100 centimeters deep into the soil. And so if you have a difference in water table, um, the canola will probably latch into that table for the long haul, where the peas are more of a short-term crop, uh, getting the surface moisture. And uh, we've had phenomenal uh, pea canola responses in river flatland because the canola just keeps growing and growing in that moisture um, and that high water table. And often we find our best responses are in excessive moisture years with pea canola and the worst responses are in the dry years and that would make sense. I'm a little frozen. Whoa. Okay, things to consider before you intercrop. <clears throat> consider your time and labor. You're probably going to need a lot more time or labor because you have an extra step, which is separating the crop at harvest. <clears throat> you also want to consider if those crops are compatible with each other in the field, looking at their maturities, their pesticides that are registered for both crops, their harvestability, that sort of thing. Uh, maybe there's some market constraints like allergens. Uh, we've heard of loads of flax that were intercropped with lentil that were completely, um, you know, sent back home, I guess you would say, because they found lentil chips in the flax sample and uh, the contract was void. So you want to make sure that with your marketing person that you're selling the crop to that maybe they're okay with a little bit of crop contamination. And this can be linked to allergens or, or splits or residues or some sort of purity thing they have in the, in the market. Uh, think about your crop rotation. Is pea canola uh, giving you diversity in your wheat canola rotation? I doubt it. But, um, you know, maybe you don't grow those crops normally. I would say growing peas with canola is a great way to grow peas if you're growing for peas. But... Uh, Try not to crunch up your uh, rotations too much. Again, talking about pesticides and weed resistance on the farm. Once you start intercropping, your options for weed resistance start going down. So you start bottlenecking your herbicides. 
Uh, make sure you have available soil moisture. My recommendation is if you've got a wet spring, this is a great time to go intercropping because you need to use up that excess moisture. Uh, harvest and cleaning. Uh, make sure you have a way to separate these crops. Uh, don't leave it to last minute to find a way to, to do that. Um, and make sure your, you know, your seeding equipment has the ability to actually seed an intercrop. Uh, the worst case scenario is a single shoot opener because you have so much product to go through that single shoot plus the fertilizer and uh, you risk, you know, obviously burning your, your seedlings with the fertilizer. Uh, make sure you have crop insurance. If you're interested in getting that, uh, there are options I'll talk about later. Your return on investment, always do, always pencil out uh, your budgets before you, you start seeding. And check to see if your province offers any BMPs because you could get some free money. Um, here's a couple of, uh, I guess, tough, uh, tough fields that uh, didn't really work out that great. Uh, on the left, we have a uh, forage pea and an oat. And of course, it actually worked out really good, that, that crop that year, but uh, the lodging would have been a, a huge challenge. And, uh, you know, a little bit of foresight on maybe increasing a seeding rate on the oat might have kept that stand up a little higher. And then on the right, uh, we have, uh, I think it was lentil and mustard together. And um, great combination, but uh, the field already had a wild sunflower issue. And thus, uh, using a group two herbicide basically let the wild sunflower go wild. And uh, you can't really see it in the picture. You see a few wild sunflowers, but in the background, it was horrific uh, down at the lower end of the 40. <clears throat> so what are the in crops or what does work good uh, from what we've found at Wado? Uh, of course, pea canola is, is a great option and adding in the alfalfa as a establishment option if you're in the alfalfa business. Uh, it worked great and we often find which is called a land equivalent ratio or LER anywhere from 1.05 to 1.62 that means anywhere from 5 to 62 percent more yield per acre by growing the crops together and there's lots of perks it's really easy to do. Uh, pea mustard is very similar uh, it's a 1.1 or a 1.2 to a 1.49 land equivalent ratio works great. Uh, P oat is great too, uh, 1.1 to 1.25. Um, it makes a great grain, like if, if you're using it for a hog ration, for example, or a cattle ration, uh, or a green feed, because uh, it bumps up the protein value of the feed. Uh, we've tried fava beans and oats, uh, very similar to pea oat. It's easy to do, easy to harvest. I was quite surprised by it, but uh, a little less of a land equivalent ratio of only uh, 0.1 uh, or 1.11. Um, and one thing I just want to say about uh, growing intercrops is you must take an account of the cost of separating the crops if you're separating them because it can take quite a bit of, uh, of your, you know, your gross income that you're earning to do that. And I found it's up to about 20% of your income is lost to the cleaning process. So if you're not making a land equivalent ratio of 1.2, you might as well not even bother intercropping. I'm sorry to say, yes, it has great benefits, but that separation cost can be a real stinger. Uh, other things we've tried uh, have been uh, corn and hairy vetch for a grazing purpose, and this has a great feed value. Uh, we've tried spring wheat with sweet clover or alfalfa in the understory. Works great for establishing that legume, and it has saline tolerance, which I'll show you a bit later. We've also tried growing rye, uh, fall rye, and hairy vetch together at the same time for seed production of the vetch.
Um, just some pictures of good intercrops, uh, the chickpea flax. I've tried chickpea flax in Manitoba, but I just can't grow chickpeas that well. Our soil is too, uh, too rich and moist, so we often have disease issues and lots of foliage. We hardly get any pods. But uh, I know they've tried it in Redvers, uh, in Saskatchewan, and further west uh, with great results. And ha they have uh, disease suppression. Our faba oats here in the picture look great. Uh, we tried them on alternate rows and mixed rows. We had a, uh, a field nearby with wheat and sweet clover. It was fantastic, and I'll talk about it a bit later. And our rye vetch idea, great way to produce uh, vetch seed. So our pea canola results show that we, uh, we use um, excess moisture a lot faster than we do with the monocrops. Um, we find that mixing the crops in the same row is more beneficial than singulating the crops into individual rows. So the more you, be, you become in a single or double or triple rows of individual crops, you tend to get more and more like a monocrop and we just don't see that interaction happening. So there is something happening down in the root level that's really interesting. Uh, we also find any applied nitrogen in the system just reduces pea nodulation formation, and it really doesn't help in the total yield or economics of anything. So uh, think of it as a low nitrogen input system, uh, and think of it as growing peas with canola as sort of like the weed you can benefit from. Uh, we also found that phosphorus helps nodulation and yield. So uh, that was awesome and makes sense. If you're over yielding, you probably need more phosphorus. And I would assume you need more nutrients in general other than nitrogen. Uh, we actually find there's no light use difference. Um, we find the, the canola matures two weeks later than pea. Uh, we find there's reduced pea seed disease, uh, soil borne disease. And uh, we find that Canola seed is larger in size, so it's like a bigger seed uh, in the harvest sample. Uh, we find fewer pea aphids in the intercrops. Uh, I suggest a 100% seeding rate in pea and a 50% canola rate uh, that you would normally sow. Um, and it's an excellent chance for alfalfa establishment. And if you're doing forage pea, it can be more challenging. So just, you know, pull back on the forage pea seeding rate uh, because there's challenges with lodging and diseases. I'm frozen again. Okay. So just a few pictures here of pea canola in the top right, or top left, I should say. You can tell the forage pea got powdery mildew in a bad way, and the monocrop fell down straight to the ground. It was actually about four feet tall, but on to the right side of that picture, uh, the pea canola kind of held up the forage peas quite a bit better. And of course, on the left side, the monocrop canola was outstanding tall. Uh, the combine in the pea canola is from uh, St. Leon, and uh, this, this producer had a, a land equivalent ratio of 1.62, uh, phenomenal crop, and he had mentioned that the combine was working so hard to get through the crop because there was so much of a crop to combine, but uh, he really liked doing it. Uh, some of the cleaning operations can be quite, uh, quite a conundrum, with all the augers running, uh, but there are simple ways to do it. You know, if you're already set up with a grain cleaner and a leg, that's great. Uh, but some of these little, uh, you know, Farm King roller units or the quick clean, uh, like you see in the picture, really do work great and they can keep up with the combine, but you still need that person there to watch uh, while the operator on the combine continues harvest. And you can see on the left side here, uh, just a sample. This is from uh, actually Dr. Linda Gorham's project. We, we took it a little on the dirty side because we didn't want to lose any of the canola out the back of the combine. Uh, but uh, the samples are a bit cleaner than that. Uh, but this was just for research purpose. 
I still have tons of questions about pea canola though, and or mustard canola. Uh, are there any mycorrhizal, are my, mycorrhizal communities better off uh, than just in canola or mustard? I imagine so, because the peas there, do we get more leaf disease in intercrops? I don't know that yet. Can we reduce root rots in pea intercrops? We've tried with aphanomyces and mustard, but we just can't get that response. Um, Phanomyces is pretty tough, same with Fusarium. Uh, does intercropping promote inferior rotations? I bet it does um, if you're in the canola business or the pea business. Um, we just have to be cognizant of our rotation. Does intercropping in rotations have advantages to monocrop rotations, such as soil building, food production, water use, fertilizer efficiency, et cetera. I imagine so, uh, but those are still to be determined. And then I had mentioned about how intercrops use more nutrients. Uh, for example, is K and other nutrients like zinc, copper, boron in more demand um, like nitrogen and phos, like we've found? Yes, I imagine so, because we're exporting even more nutrients off that field if we're um, harvesting more crop. Does peola reduce greenhouse gases better than monocrops? I have no idea, but we'll find out maybe someday. Can we design equipment better for intercrops like our combines and cedars? Yes, I imagine so. Um, we can have, uh, you know, seeding hoses uh, merging together, for example, from different, uh, um, you know, compartments. Combines, I can imagine maybe we could just separate in the field on the go uh, if they're designed just that way with their sieves. Uh, maybe we need two elevators on our combines. I'm not too sure. Can we use VR or variable rate in Piola both for seed and fertilizer to be more efficient? I would love to do this project on a, you know, a field scale, uh, but uh, the time and money to do that project is is a little over my head right now, but someday I would like to try that. I'll show you why. For example, this, uh, this field near Nesbitt, uh, this farmer grew peas, oats, and mustard all at the same rate at the same time. However, the nature of the crop itself separated itself out in the field based on topography. So the peas grew on the hills, the oats grew kind of on the sides of the hills, and then the mustard grew in the low spots and it just sorted itself out naturally like that. And the, the producer harvested it and had to separate the crop uh, later, but uh, makes me wonder if there's something there uh, going on based on topography and maybe we should be doing variable rate uh, technology with intercrops. Uh, I think that's quite compelling and thus you would treat the zones differently with fertilizer as well. What, what doesn't work with intercrops uh, from our projects? Uh, we found that fava bean and buckwheat do not work well just because it has a, a low land equivalent ratio. Fava bean and flax uh, we found has poor threshability. And you can see in the picture, uh, the fava beans were just chewed up from the combine because we're trying to thresh the flax at very high rotor speeds, but uh, unfortunately the fava beans uh, had to get beaten up over it. We've tried flax and soybean, and uh, this has a low land equivalent ratio. We get lots of chips in the flax sample, and we actually had water supply issues with the flax being so thirsty, they were taking all the moisture away from the soybean. You can see that in the, the photo below. We've tried winter wheat and a soybean relay where you have rows of soybean within rows of wheat. Uh, again, we had drought issues with this combination and just poor economics. Why bother chasing only 10% more yield advantage when you have to go over the field twice with your equipment? That just is insane. And I see this happening in the United States. And I really, really want to find out if they're actually making any economic progress on that crop 
having the two in relay uh, because they still have to travel the field twice with their equipment. And that just doesn't make sense to me. <clears throat> Corn, hairy, vetch, uh, this is more like a relay, uh, either for grain or silage. I would say it's a, it's probably pretty risky to do silage or grain because of the vetch tangling either in the uh, the corn header or the silage reapers. Uh, we've tried hemp and pea before, um, just hasn't worked out. Uh, I'll show you a picture why. Um, the peas and the hemp sample, you know, we got to clean this hemp sample of the green material anyway, dry it down, and I don't think it'll be any advantage to having peas in that mix. And I know there's a Saskatoon farmer uh, in Saskatchewan that had grown hemp and pea together, had a great sample, you can see it in the picture, but he still has to separate those crops. And I'm not sure it would be a great advantage to having them together. Uh, our land equivalent ratios were only like 1.1. And like I mentioned, you need a 1.2 to even break even on separating costs. And on the bottom left corner is our winter wheat soybean project. Uh, it certainly works, but it's a bust on the economics. Some other risky intercrops include sunflower and hairy vetch. Uh, uh, the guy there standing in the sunflowers uh, is a Newfeld scholar looking at intercrops. And uh, it looked fantastic until the harvest. Uh, it, uh, it looked like sort of a challenge. And you can see there on the far right side that the, the harvest was a challenge because he didn't have a sunflower header for his combine. He just uses reel. And the hairy vetch was winding on his reel. And it was also winding on his uh, straw chopper, which just caused a, a nightmare. However, uh, he did finish the field and uh, you can see quite a bit of vetch residue there. Um, I'll maybe talk about a bit later. Um, down on the left, uh, bottom left is a hairy vetch and rye field. This producer was going for the vetch seed side of it, but the vetch overwhelmed the rye and it all fell down on him. And the, the rye ended up uh, starting to rot because of uh, compaction of the biomass. We've also been doing a bit of work here at Wado looking at corn and hairy vetch. And yes, we have problems with our corn header uh, winding the vetch, you can see on the right side, into the, uh, the chopper of the corn stalks. And it was just, uh, just, you know, we only had one acre of this. I can't imagine having, you know, 2000 acres of it to, for combining. It would be a lot of work. Popularity in Manitoba for intercrops, uh, we had in 2023 about almost 9,000 acres. Um, now this is what they call mixed grain. Uh, in 2022, we had 9,600 and 21, uh, 7,400 acres. Not that much uh, because in Manitoba, we have 11 million acres of cultivated land. So we're talking a very below 1% fraction um, of acres. Uh, now we also have polycrop, which could be uh, a cover crop, for example, and we actually had 16,000 acres in Manitoba this year. Looking at insurance uh, and incentives, Manitoba did offer BMP programming for intercrops, looking at, uh, you know, covering the cost of uh, cleaning equipment, uh, equipment modifications and the seed, but that program is discontinued with the new SCAP. Um, Global Ag Risk Solutions offers uh, income insurance for any farm operation with crops, uh, guarantees your income based on historical gross margins and forward projections. That's what the company quoted to me. And then we have our um, local MASC, which is our crop insurance uh, for Manitoba. And they have a mixed grain or polycrops uh, insurance. So we have uh, up to 165 acres. You can maximize your insurance for 
intercrops under the novel crops insurance program for nine dollars an acre and up to a four hundred dollar coverage per acre and the poly crops is just for establishment between forty and eighty dollars an acre whoops where am i okay I'm going to talk more about relay cropping now. Um, looking at uh, this, we're talking about two or more crops with staggered outcomes for harvest or growth patterns. So for example, in this picture uh, was the crop uh, spring wheat and sweet clover I had talked about. And then the next year, the clover continues as a relay uh, after the wheat to keep going and growing. So really you don't have to reseed because the crop is already seeded. Uh, this is the Harry Vetch uh, sunflower relay concept. Oops. And this is what it looked like, uh, you know, in July or August. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the field of sunflowers that looks quite normal. But then in the canopy, you can kind of see the flowers of the vetch crawling all the way up to the head. And, you know, I got to thinking this is probably not a bad thing for the bees because bees had at least something to uh, to feed off of during the summer after the sunflower had uh, finished flowering. So uh, one thing I noticed is the, the, the rust in the sunflower was becoming more apparent, uh, perhaps with having such a dense canopy of uh, hairy vetch. After harvest, they had this residue of vetch and they, once the snow melted, they actually went out and uh, um, swathed the stover, I guess, and the, the vetch together and then harvested the vetch again. And they ended up getting not only 2,300 pound per acre sunflower crop, which is actually a great crop, but they ended up getting 500 pounds an acre of vetch seed uh, not only within the sunflower sample, but after combining and recombining again. So um, they were able to sell that vetch seed for something like $5 a pound uh, after the sunflower harvest, which actually worked out pretty good, despite the challenges of the, the vetch winding on the combine. So we've uh, been doing some projects here. At, oops doing some projects here at Wado with sunflower and vetch. And we found we can get anywhere from a 59 to 136 pound nitrogen credit from the hairy vetch residues uh, when we intercrop them with sunflower. We also found there was really no yield difference in the sunflower. And we had a one year soil organic matter increase of uh, a quarter percent, which is actually quite phenomenal. It's two and a half times normal uh, of normal. So that was interesting. And we reduced our weeds by 80% by including the vetch that would have normally grown in monocrop sunflower plot. Um, but we do have an issue with volunteer vetch seed. Uh, this is leftover seed that, you know, goes over the combine or is dormant and never grew in the first place. Uh, there's the combining issues and the disease issues with uh, sclerotinia and rust that we were finding. Another concept here is corn and vetch, and this is a producer's field who was going to use it to graze his uh, his bison. It was phenomenal, and this was a one-pass system with a seed hawk, uh, or seed master, I should say, with a special corn roller that you can get, and the, the producer had modified the seed hawk, sorry, the seed master to uh, to uh, meter out hairy vetch uh, between the rows of, of corn. And it worked pretty good. And he claims uh, with his bison, he was saving 40 cents per pound gain uh, per cow per day. So that was, you know, a significant savings, uh, perhaps uh, saving 40 to, you know, maybe 20 to 40% of his uh, feed bill by including the vetch. We've also been doing a little bit of trial work, uh, trying to figure out uh, what rate of Roundup we can use to 
uh, accommodate the the corn vetch system. And we know that uh, vetch is very tolerant to to Roundup or, or to glyphosate. And we found about a half liter per acre of the 540 rate <clears throat> is enough to, um, uh, you know, basically let hairy vetch keep growing. And we've had rates all the way up to two liters an acre of 540 that still doesn't kill hairy vetch. So just to be wary for the, the audience, uh, when you work with hairy vetch, it can be kind of a hairy monster if you're not watching and uh, glyphosate will not control it. Only uh, a couple other herbicides will, and I'll show you that here. So we also had a, a project um, looking at vetch within populations of corn uh, to see if we could have a better feed value or to see what kind of effect it has on grain production in the corn. And uh, we had a significant decrease in the weeds again, just like we saw in the, the sunflower. Uh, we witnessed a 16% loss in grain yield in corn by using vetch. However, total biomass for the field was the same. So this kind of pushes toward more of the grazing idea. And uh, so basically it didn't matter what rate of corn we had, uh, it was very robust in a way of accommodating for the difference in biomass. And uh, you know, if you have more corn, you just had a little bit less vetch, but if you had less corn, you had a bit more vetch. Uh, what really was the stark difference was the feed quality tests that we took. And uh, we had gains in crude protein, for example, of, uh, you know, quite a few percent. Uh, the uh, energy for metabolic use was a lot better. Relative feed values improved by a few points. And so we start to think that uh, maybe we're um, getting something good here. And once we worked the, the numbers backwards in terms of nitrogen economy, we were finding we were gaining about uh, anywhere from 10 to about 23 pounds an acre of uh, more nitrogen per acre than if we were growing just normal corn uh, as a monocrop. So uh, we were changing the economy of nitrogen on the field scale too. This is sort of a delay here. Uh, one thing we're finding, though, uh, of course, is the, the vetch winding on the corn header and also the vetch uh, having, you know, late seed uh, in the year after in the canola stand. Um, this can be a big problem if, uh, if you've kind of got a, a hairy vetch hangover, is what I call it. And uh, basically the seed is either dormant or comes from the harvest of the previous year and then causes problems the next year. So you better have a plan. Uh, there was nothing we could spray in that Liberty Canola to get rid of hairy vetch. It's uh, even quite uh, resistant to Liberty as well. So we did try a uh, herbicide screening trial. This is just the list of the herbicides we use to try and find a way to either control hairy vetch or work with it. And uh, I'll just get the picture here coming up. Whoops. This is, uh, this is the project um, from kind of a uh, aerial point of view, looking down at the project, at the different uh, products. And we found that things like Banville, which is dicamba, uh, 2,4-D, uh, Mextrol, which is uh, bromoxynol and MCPA, uh, Interline or Armazon work pretty good at controlling the vetch. Uh, interestingly, Heat uh, did not work against the vetch or Volterra. Um, Spike was another product or pyroxysulfone that actually didn't surprise me. The Muster surprised me that it was quite tolerant to that too. Uh, Prime Extra 2 Magnum, that's a atrazine product. Uh, it, it made it sick, but uh, 
um, the vet still kind of grew through it. And of course, Roundup was uh, quite tolerant. Um, so kind of an interesting project, but uh, it wasn't replicated, but uh, just give us an idea of what we can use. We also have a, a companion crop project uh, with the University of Manitoba, looking at different covers like uh, radish, uh, crimson clover, hairy vetch, and Italian ryegrass. And uh, we've done this for two years. There's locations all across the prairies. And for us in Melita, it's been a bust sort of, uh, especially this year, the grasshoppers were phenomenally bad. And uh, we lost all our cover crop because of the hoppers, but the corn was okay. Um, the hoppers prefer the cover crop. Um, the spring wheat project, it's not really a project, it was a field we were following nearby uh, Melita and uh, it was a spring wheat and sweet clover under organic production. Uh, the farmer swathed the wheat and it ended up going 40 bushel a acre, a great organic crop. Sold it for $18 a bushel back then uh, for an amazing uh, income. And he used uh, sweet clover at five pounds an acre using a Pottinger seed drill, which uh, is actually, uh, I think it's on five or six inch row spacing. It's quite dense. And he just used the mid row bander to broadcast the, the clover. And he got a great catch. One of the neat things I saw was that the sweet clover was uh, preferably growing in the saline areas when the wheat wasn't. And I thought, boy, this is going to actually do a little bit of salinity mitigation. Uh, it's going to use a lot of water in these spots, which is the problem, and uh, maybe uh, change the compaction issue that was going on because it was a, uh, a, uh, an approach for equipment. And then the next year it grew, uh, you could see the windrows of uh, where they swathed the wheat. It was etiolated, so it kind of died off in those rows. But nonetheless, uh, great catch of sweet clover. Um, this is the approach where the saline spot was, and you can tell it was getting better as the year went on. Uh, the sweet clover was kind of fixing that spot. It was 1.2 meters tall. Uh, almost over my head, and there wasn't a single weed in the canopy uh, below. We had done some projects uh, with the same idea, coincidentally, in the same year. And uh, this is just one of them here. You can see the sweet clover trying to almost get above the spring wheat uh, heads, but uh, that's about as far as it got. And... Uh, what we found is a slight yield decrease in spring wheat uh, when we either seeded or pre-broadcast the clover um, or the alfalfa. It, uh, I was still kind of inconclusive on this uh, of what really happened. The yields were so close together, uh, it might be just by chance and I would love to run that project again. We were basically looking at alfalfa or clover either being pre-broadcast, seeded, or post-broadcast after seeding and its effect. Um, but uh, it's certainly a good way to establish the crop, uh, the, uh, the relay crop after. You can see after harvest, it's starting to grow again. And um, one thing I would kind of push hard on this is that if you want it to be successful, you must have a rainfall soon after seeding your your uh, clover or alfalfa in these stands. Otherwise, it will never grow. It needs that quick start as soon as the spring wheat starts. Otherwise, the wheat just gets too competitive and dries the soil out. Why would we want to do some of these relay crops? Well, you just never know what the weather is going to bring. And this, for example, is kind of that concept you have on the top side of the picture, uh, we had a lot of excessive moisture in 2011 and the crop in the area was using up um, as much as it could. So in the bottom half of the picture, they had winter wheat with alfalfa growing and the alfalfa was a relay to the winter wheat. And 
they were not suffering from uh, excessive moisture because the alfalfa obviously was using a lot. But to the north side or the top side in that field, uh, the other field, the spring annual crop was suffering uh, from excessive moisture quite, about, quite badly. We've had a lot of good times here in Melita. Um, the photo in the bottom right is a, a farmer in the area who actually won a contest uh, for stuck in the muck uh, photo contest. And, uh, you know, I get to thinking maybe we should be growing some more uh, cover crop relays um, just to prevent some of these issues from happening where we have way too much moisture that we have to deal with and our equipment's just too big and it sinks in the ground. Perhaps there is a better way with these uh, cover crops or relay crops. I had the opportunity to tour in France in not only 2015, but 2018, uh, where um, Frederick Thomas there, he's the, the fellow in the plaid shirt. Um, he, he came to Melita in 2020 to visit as well. Uh, we were looking at fields in France that were uh, under intensive, I would call it regenerative practices with livestock, uh, no-till, that sort of thing. And uh, just to show you a few pictures, there's the livestock. They got sheep grazing on cover crops. Uh, this is on a very sandy soil. And uh, then the neighbor soil here who, if you can believe it or not, uh, is trying to grow rye. And uh, there's supposed to be a rye crop growing on that field. There is, but it's very, uh, very flooded. And it's because they were using tillage constantly and degrading the soil quality. Um, we just start digging away here. And in comparison, on the left side is the, the tilled field that's supposed to be growing rye. And it's just like that uh, really sticky muck mud. And there was absolutely no earthworms, no organic matter. And the crop looks sick. Where on the right side, uh, Frederick Thomas using his uh, regenerative egg practices. Uh, they've got lots of worms. Uh, the soil is darker. It's got an organic layer to it. Well drained, uh, uses cover crops and grazing. Uh, really a stark change And these fields are within two miles of each other. Uh, just cannot believe the difference. And that really sent it home for me that one thing we're doing something great with no-till out here in the prairies but two, that uh, tillage really can reduce our soil quality over time. And uh, these things we really need to remember. Maybe there's more we can do with our saline areas um, that we, we tend to have. So uh, just one more comment. Uh, it is a slippery slope though, uh, given climate change. Uh, you know, we've, we've been through quite a few drought years as well in recent times, uh, growing cover crops can really limit your moisture capacity um, and, uh, you know, uh, reduce your chances of having a great cash crop uh, the year after having it. So just, you have to really pay attention to your environmental um, capacity on your farm. If uh, the climate's changing hot and dry, you better get rid of that cover crop uh, if you're not going to use it because your cash crop will fail. So that's all about all I have. If there's any questions, I can take them now. There you go. Uh, hi, Scott. Thanks for a nice presentation. Uh, I was wondering if you have collected any data on uh, mycorrhizas uh, under no-till conditions because you guys have been doing no-till since 2006. Right. We have not. I would love to. Um, it's simply uh, um, a matter of taking samples, I suppose, and sending them to the, pe the people that can uh, see that sort of thing. I cannot see that stuff because uh, I don't have the equipment. <laughs> okay. oh, I was just wondering how it differs from the forest ecosystem and in the field ecosystem. Like, does it affect, no tillage affect the mycorrhizal growth or not? 
Have you observed is, anything visually? Or like you my know? hypothesis is is that, uh, for example, if you grow flax after canola, you mm -hmm. will have a yield depression uh, yeah. because of the canola causing mycorrhizae to uh, to stall. Um, yeah. I would think if you had a green bridge, for example, having the con the peas there mm -hmm. as a a host, that mm -hmm. uh, you'll have a better rotation in flax if you had to go into flax after canola. Okay. Yeah. And the one unrelated question, you talked about dry land rice up there. It did not work. But uh, have you tried wild rice, the Gigi plus terrace? Uh, University no. of Manitoba is working on that. Uh, I was wondering if you have tried. I have not tried wild rice uh, in Melita, but uh, I do know it grows near Carberry naturally. Uh, just in the wetlands, and uh, there's quite a industry around yeah. the pot, um, but uh, I don't think there's been any formal breeding uh, programs or agronomic programs in my recollection. Okay, there are some in U.S., but I thought you guys have a lot of wetland or moist area, so yeah. you might want to give it a try. It might work there. Yeah, it's a decent industry in the north, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Try and speak into it, get it as close to your mouth as possible. Yeah, yeah, so great presentation. Uh, I'm just one question. Uh, I know it's a lot of work, but what would you say? What would you say the best way of doing it? Is it going this road or all the way? Okay, he asked, he said, first of all, great presentation. And he said, secondly, um, when it comes to your intercropping, what do you find better, alternate row or mixed row? Mixed row all the time. And I think there, it's just because of the root associations. Now, uh, I suppose there's, you know, like in our row crop situation that we've been doing with either sunflower or corn, um, I would say row crops are uh, superior. Um, in that regard where they have to be in a row crop situation and maybe the covers or the inner crop is between those rows. Um, it just seems to work better. And that's more of a equipment logistics thing for sure. If you're gonna try and speak loud so everyone can vote with that. Uh, Scott, just curious about sweet clover intercrops, and it looks like you've done quite a bit on it. It's uh, something we haven't touched on, but what's your experience there? Is it uh, a better fit with wheat or? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, and in comparison, I would say it's better with spring wheat than it is with winter wheat. Um, and it seems to be a timing issue with the I would say the winter survivability of sweet clover and um, also the competitiveness that winter wheat poses. Um, so with the winter wheat clover idea, uh, we rarely see success uh, just because that winter wheat is so competitive um, and the, the winter overwintering qualities aren't quite there uh, in my opinion. Um, we have it in the ground again this this fall, and I'm I'm really excited to see if it does work. We had quite a mild fall here, and so the clovers did get ahead quite well. Uh, whether they overwinter, we'll see. Um, and to what degree they plan to grow. So, like sweet clover is a biennial, and if you plant it one year, it'll flower the next and be very aggressive. So I'm really curious to see if the sweet clover is going to be super aggressive on the winter wheat, if it does pull through winter, because it's going to want to get into flower time likely, uh, just genetically, where if you put it with spring wheat, the, the physiology of, of sweet clover is a vegetative phase, and it'll only stay about six inches tall, uh, six to maybe 12 inches tall, and it won't out compete with spring wheat but it'll be very successful at establishment so my success has been with spring wheat and clover well, very nice thank you
flex, and you asked him what the end use flex default was. Oh. Was it A, file out, or C? Yeah, a question was asked about the end use for the sweet clover. Was it a plow down or a for seed? They actually, uh, they were really contemplating to do a plow down because they're organic producer, but they found a decent market for the seed. And so they went and harvested uh, or swathed the crop to, in order to harvest for seed. And uh, that's the way they went. I'm not sure what sort of nitrogen credit they would have got, likely slightly less. But uh, I would say the majority of that nitrogen credit was likely still in the field despite having a harvest. Oh, thanks. Love the presentation. Yeah, you're welcome. And thanks for the, the invite. And if anybody wants to chat, you know, another day or whatever, you have my contact information on the slide. You can also visit our, um, our website, which is Manitoba Diversification Centers. And uh, maybe you'll find some, some material there from the other sites as well that might be more of interest. Thank you.